I know I shouldn't start. There's always a straggler. Um, welcome to the start of CST8250, uh, Database Design and Administration. Um, I'm going to go through some of the stuff for the course first and then dive into the first lecture. Uh, the first couple of lectures of this course are really freaking long. Uh, so I will probably split lecture one partway through and continue next week. Um, for the first week, I really don't like keeping people here for two hours at eight o'clock at night. That's not cool. Um, so I'm just going to go through, I'll tell you guys about myself so you have an idea who I am. Um, a few best practices, that kind of stuff. Okay. So about me, uh, my name is Dan Goudreau, uh, which you should probably know because that's what it says on Axis, or says Daniel Goudreau, I guess. I go by Dan. Uh, I graduated from Canada or College in 1996. Uh, it's been a while. Um, no, I don't have extra letters after my name. Literally, three year college diploma, been employed full time since. So, yeah, I didn't go to school to learn about going to school. I've been working as a professional developer ever since. Uh, literally, since I graduated, I've been unemployed for maybe a grand total of three weeks in 26 years. Uh, it's a good industry to be in. Um, I work full-time, and I teach part-time, which means that during the day, I may not answer emails very quickly, as I have a job to do. Um, it doesn't mean I don't care about my teaching. It just means I've got a job. Um, I currently work full-time for a company called Kedlink Technology. Uh, it's a division of a company called EF Perry. Um, probably two companies nobody in here has ever heard of, and that's okay. Uh, we're very niche. Uh, we work in the sign making industry. We write software for sign makers, which again, people are going, uh, um, you know, billboards, the printing of billboards. Somebody's got to have software to design and print that shit. That's what we do. We write the software to print large format printers. Uh, garment printing, we do that too. Laser engraving, we do that too. Anything that has to do with uh, signage and, you know, marketing and that kind of stuff. Uh, my company's been around for 20, 26 years, 27 years. So we've been around for a while. Um, what do I do there? I'm a full stack web developer, uh, network administrator, server administrator. Uh, used to be general IT, but that's gone now, thankfully. Uh, I like playing with computers. I just don't like playing with other people's computers uh, if I don't have to. Um, so, but my main job is a full stack web developer. So that means I do everything from designing the database all the way to implementing UI and every step in between, including standing up the web servers, setting up the database servers, uh, setting up the appropriate crap in Amazon, all that fun stuff. Um, so what kind of person am I? Um, I've got a loose and easygoing teaching style. Um, I don't have notes because I teach what I do for a living. So if I need notes to teach you guys what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, that probably means I don't know how to do my job. Um, but you know, it's fairly flexible. Uh, I have lots of side stories of things not to do because uh, in 26 years, I've managed to do every bad thing you could do to a computer uh, creatively at that. Uh, I've been told I can be sarcastic. Uh, not as bad as it used to be. So, you know, I'm just warning you now. I understand that life happens. Um, you know, we all know shit happens. And I'm fairly understanding. Uh, but by the same token, I don't for fools, if your dog peed on your laptop three times in three weeks, I'm going to stop believing you. Just saying, you know, hey, your lab, for, the, for those of you that have me as their lab prof, you can't submit lab one because your dog ate your laptop three times. I'm like, maybe you should put your laptop away. Don't leave it where the dog can get at it. I don't know. Um within reason. Like if you have to go to the hospital, you go to the hospital. If you're sick, you're sick, that kind of thing. Um, I'm also known as an equal opportunity offender. Uh, I've been known to roast my students. I'll call people out in class if they're being stupid. Um, it is what it is. Um, I don't, I will not, 
I am not doing it maliciously. I am doing it to interact with you. Um, it was just, yeah, when people are disruptive in class, I'll call them out on it. And it's usually not in a polite manner. Okay, so best practices for success. I attend lab, lectures and labs. Okay, that one, that's because I have to say that. Okay, it has to be in writing. You've noticed I'm wearing a headset. Some of you may have noticed there's a camera right there. I'll explain that soon enough. Um, for those of you that have me for their lab prop, I've already gone through the expectations. Uh, those that have Wei, uh, I don't know if you've had him yet. Um, I don't know. He's going to set his own expectations. So your lab prof will set the rules for your lab period. I'm not going to elaborate on that. Uh, but in regards to lecture attendance, I recommend you attend. That way you can ask questions. If you don't show up, you can't ask questions. I don't take attendance. Uh, I've always found that to be a waste of time. Uh, they didn't take attendance when I went in call. I was in college. I don't feel I should treat you guys like high school kids. Um, so that's that. The course, definitely we do one lecture. It's a topic. The next week, we move on to the next topic. We don't go back. So other than today's super long first lecture that's going to be carried into next week, every week is self-contained, whatever that topic is. Um, if you are going to be sick, uh, normally, especially for the labs more than anything else, um, you know, let us know if something's going horribly wrong in your life. That way, at least we can be accommodating as much as we can. Um, all the course materials available on Brightspace, literally everything is going to be there. Um, there is no textbook. Uh, if there's links of stuff you can read off of Brightspace, I will point them out to you. Um, I do recommend that you pre-read the slides. It's up to you. Um, I post a weekly announcement, usually the, you know, the day of or the day after the lecture saying, this is what you're supposed to be working on. This is when it's due. This is what you should be reading. So that there's no mystery as to, in case I forget to say something in class, it's always going to be in the announcements of stuff. Um, complete the labs. Obviously, uh, for those of you that had me already in for the lab period have heard this, this course has 10 labs and two tests. That is the entirety of the assessment for this course. There is no practical lab. There's no hybrid. It is 10 labs, two tests. So you miss a lab, it's going to take a chunk out of your grade. You miss two labs, you're not getting an A+. Plus. End of story. No matter if you have 100% and everything else, there's odds of you getting an A+, plus are very, very small. Um, late labs usually have a 20% deduction, at least that's my rule. So if you're late at the end of a week, up to a week, you get 20% off the top. More than a week, you can make it very easy for me. Zero. I say zeros are easy for me. That means I don't even need to read your work. Um, and, you know, as usual, ask questions whenever possible. Practice as applicable. Um, if you got study buddies, use them. It's, it's a good system. Uh, Chat GPT has gone very good at explaining shit to people. Uh, by the same token, uh, this course used to have electronic tests, no more. Thanks, chat GPT. Uh, or you should thank the 15 students that got busted during a single test last semester. In one lecture, there was an online test. They caught 15 students in that one group cheating using chat GPT during a test. So it said until we... Come up with a brand new way of writing tests that's kind of chat GPT proof. Good luck. Uh, they're on paper. Such is life. All right. So what are we going to learn? Um, week one, we're going to start talking about data modeling and database design. Week two, uh, we're going to we're gonna do diagramming. Uh, week three, normalization. Uh, normalization is probably the most painful topic of the whole semester. Uh, some people get it. Some people struggle to get it. Some people never get it. Uh, it's a good thing it's only a topic. But normalizing, I'll do my best to try to make it make sense. Um, 
Then I'm going to cover the database design process, the actual process from start to end of how to do a database. Uh, we're going to cover indexes and views. And on week six, we're going to have a quick review. It's usually about 20 minutes. And then what I normally do, it's not on the slides, but what I normally do is I'll do an entire design from start to finish, like from raw data all the way to an ERD. So literally in week six, you see the entire, everything we've covered, the entire term, all done as one process so you can see how it actually how it's done um week seven you're going to take your test in class week eight you get to take a week off yay the, the summer week a reading week is the best reading week because it's nice out the fall one it's raining the winter one well it's winter the summer one's nice you'll find me on the side of a river somewhere fishing for that week uh, week nine, uh, we're going to talk about backup. So we're getting more into the administration side of the deal. Backup and restore. Um, week 10, database security. Uh, week 11, 12, and 13 is all about programming the database. So you guys learned about SQL last semester. That wasn't programming. That's interacting with the database. You're asking the database questions. You're telling the database to do stuff. Magic ensues. 11, 12, and 13, and usually actually it's more like 11 and 12, uh, because 12, um, 11 and 12 are usually, I usually cover almost those two in a single lecture. Um, and then 13 is transactions, which is cool. Uh, we'll have a review on week 14. Week 15, we're all going to be sitting in some other room somewhere else to write an exam. So your labs are half your grade. So each lab is 5% of your grade. So like I said, if you miss two labs, you're not getting your A+. Plus. So it's not even point asking at that point. Uh, the midterm is 20%. The final exam is 30%. Um, I may be changing that to be 25 and 25, just to make sure it's balanced completely between the two. Um, the other good news is that the two tests are independent from each other. So you take the midterm, you write the test, you can promptly forget everything you just learned. Week eight, to week 13 is on the final exam. Week one to week six is on the midterm. So it's two separate units, no carry forward uh, knowledge from one section to the other, which is good. It makes it easier for you guys. Uh, this is technically a three to four course. Um, three hours of theory, two hours in class, one hour online, realistically, it's two hours in class because there's no hybrid. There's no one hour online. So which you, that's assuming that you'll have an extra hour that for you to study if you want to. Uh, two hours of lab. Most of the labs are easy to do in under two hours. Um, some of them are a little tougher. But the thing is, you guys don't have homework and you don't have assignments. So the labs are meant to be somewhat beefy. Uh, and four hours of study time, as I tell to my students, that number is a guideline. Realistically, for some of you, it'll be like negative two hours a week of studying. Uh, those are the ones that don't even come to lecture. Um, some people will take the full four hours a week. Some people will do two. Some people will do half an hour. It all depends on the person. But, you know, they say assume up to four hours for this course. All right, so that's course intro. I am going to pop into Brightspace really quick so you guys know where everything is. Although, you guys are level twos, so you do know what Brightspace looks like, which is good. No, there's no lab exams. There's no practical assessments. Pardon? Yeah. So... The labs cover your practical skills. The two tests cover your theory, your theory knowledge. That's it. Should be as is. Unless I discover something, I did redo two of the labs for this semester because the normalization lab was an absolute dog's breakfast. Uh, if I had to spend twenty minutes. Every 
lab explaining to students that what is expected, it's not a good lab. So the normalization lab is completely new. And one of the other labs, some major adjustments on the work. Um, in spirit, they should not change. If anything needs to change, you'll be told. Okay? I wouldn't reach ahead too far in case we discover there's issues and then you have to go back and redo, which kind of sucks if you have to redo. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to put out the big pieces here where things are under the content. Um, I will be putting in the class times and the locations in there. Uh, under course information, they're just not there right now because uh, I didn't get uh, ways uh, information until last night. So I was kind of busy today at work. Um, next one down you'll see is recordings right there. As you've noticed, I've got a microphone on. I've got a mic, a camera on. I record my lectures, uh, which is why attendance on lecture is optional. If you're really, really sick, um, and you're contagious. Please don't come and sneeze on your classmates. Um, if anything else, the last four years have taught us that we shouldn't be snotting all over our classmates. Um, but I've had this policy even before COVID ever happened. Um, if you're sick, don't make other people around you sick. Um, mind you, you probably have other classes today. So, you know, the other profs may have different policies, but I make attendance optional. Um, to the labs. So you'll find the recordings up. Now, today I have two lectures back to back. I literally finished a lecture just before this class. So normally I try to upload the lectures the same day. Probably not going to happen because I'm not going to get home till late tonight and it takes like an hour for each lecture to rip. So it might take a little bit. Um, but they should be up tomorrow at some point within a day or two. And then there'll be a link in recordings and in the announcements as pointing you to the recordings. Uh, they are on YouTube. Um, so when you see that first link, you'll find my YouTube channel. I've got like seven years worth of lectures in there. So you can go back. Theoretically, you can even go back and just watch all the content from last semester. And not join me here. But I not necessarily wouldn't recommend that because you can't ask questions. But, you know. Last semester was weird anyways, because we had a week canceled. We had a lecture canceled because of a storm. And, you know, the semester before, last spring semester, we had a whole week canceled because of the big storm. So we had issues. Um, labs, all the labs are listed under labs. And uh, you just, you know, follow the instructions. These are fairly straightforward. Um, the lecture content for each week is going to be present. Uh, so week one is what we're talking about today. It has the intro and the first set of slide decks. Uh, there's a link to the first lab. So in case you don't want to bother, do look at the lab and try to find it. You can just go to the week number and find the lab. And there's often a PDF document um, in there. This is documents I've assembled over the years that covers additional material. And that's basically where you're going to find your stuff in, in here. Um, So any questions about how I intend to run the class before I actually dive into this week's content? I'm assuming this is your last class of the day for you guys. Better for you guys than my uh, level one students. They have me, then they have a lecture. They have two lectures. They have three lectures back to back today. Sucks to be them. Um, <laughs> that's literally what I said to one of them. Uh, but yeah, so any questions about my expectations or your expectations or I'll take the sound of crickets as no. Okay. And now this is not doing what it's supposed to do. Nice. That's an interesting um, full screen job. Okay. Battery's still good. All right. I love it when uh, PowerPoint doesn't do its thing. Hang on, let's try that again. Okay, whatever, I give up. Okay, so 
I'm going to do a quick review about something you learned last semester, uh, the topic of keys. Uh, we're going to talk about the basic parts of tables and what entities and attributes are, um, relationships, how they're defined, and then depending on how late it gets, I may pick a, an arbitrary stopping point and we'll pick up from there. Um, all right, keys. You guys should roughly remember what a key is from last semester. Um, it's, you know, the piece of the database we used to uniquely identify each row. Uh, probably you were, they were referred to as a primary key. Um, so a unique key basically allows you to find a specific row in the database by being unique. That's the only way you can find something unique is if you have a unique key. Um, so what happens if we don't have uh, primary keys or uniquely identified rows? Uh, it's easy to duplicate data. Now, in this group, I've got actually a fairly unique uh, set of names. I had one semester where I had three Mohammed Mohammeds in class. Oh, really? I had three students, three guys. They sat together. So it was like Mohammed, 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 Mohammed. And I'm not joking. I'm totally serious. Well, it was a joke. It's kind of funny, but but it wasn't funny because I never knew which Mohammed I was talking to. Then they were all spelt the same. So there wasn't even a variation in how Muhammad was spelt. But data could be duplicated because I had three Muhammads in one class. So realistically, if I was going based on their names, I had no way to uniquely identify them on their names. Therefore, they had a primary key, also known as a student number. Um, so if you don't have a key, data could be duplicated. That happens. Uh, we can't count rows because if you're duplicating data, there's no point counting the rows because they're not going to be unique. Again, I go select uh, count distinct name from student where names equal to Mohammed. One. You know, I had three because their names were the same, right? You can't uniquely count things that don't have unique values. Um, the integrity and quality of the data is going to suffer and be compromised because, again, you have no way to know if your data is accurate if it's potentially being duplicated. Um, the main role of the keys outside of uniquely making unique rows is also allowing relationships to exist between tables. Uh, writing queries that don't have proper keys is really unpleasant. As somebody who's had to do it, uh, it's really not a good time. So, there's many kinds of keys, but there's only three that we have to talk about for this course. There's primary keys. So that's one or multiple columns. So if it's one column, it's a primary key. If it's more than one column, it's still a primary key, but it's also known as a composite key, which you'll notice the third bullet point. Um, so the primary key is a way to uniquely identify a row of data. A foreign key is usually a column in another table that contains the value of a primary key elsewhere. So for example, your primary key at the school is what? Your student number. When we have course sections, what do they have in the course section? They don't have your name, they have your student number. So for CST 8250, 23S, Section 300, there's a database in Access, there's a table in Access with that in it. It will have an entry for each of your student numbers. Your primary key is carried into the child table as a foreign key. That's a pretty straightforward concept. Once you see it, it makes more sense. But that's the concept, and you guys probably learned about querying using foreign keys last semester using uh, joins. So these are not exclusive terms. Something can theoretically be a primary key, a composite key, and part of a foreign key all at the same time. That's when you have really complicated relationships where you have a table that is a weak entity, which I believe I'm going to be talking about at some point. Um, the weak entity needs the foreign key, as in the primary key of another table, as part of its primary key to exist. Therefore, 
the field is a foreign key, it participates in a primary key, and it's a composite key all at the same time. It's possible to have all three. It, is it a good database design? Personally, I don't think so. Does it exist out there? Yes. Yes, it does. Um, if there's any way to do something badly, somebody has managed to do it. And it once was a time where that was considered appropriate practice. So older database systems that you know go back to the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, you'll see that kind of behavior a lot more than you'll see in a modern something that's being created right now because the methodology has evolved. The technology has not evolved, but how you do it has evolved. It's just like when you build a house. It used to be when you framed a wall, you put a two by four on the bottom, you put a two by four on the top, you put two by fours up the end. Now you do something called California corners, which is two two by fours on each side, and you add a double plate on the top because it makes the wall stronger. All the same pieces, all the same technology, hammer, nail, wood, but what we do with it has evolved. And it's the same thing with how we use keys. All, this, all the tools are there, just you don't use them quite the same way. All right, so primary keys. It's one or many columns, also known as attributes, that uniquely identify each row in a database. Uh, a key is usually a sequence of numbers in a properly designed database uh, so that no numbers are ever repeated. Um, it's possible to use other values as long as they're guaranteed to be unique. For example, your student numbers come from a sequence. Just because they all start with 040, 040 is just Algonquin's college code. The numbers after that is your actual student number. And it's literally, every the number gets assigned to you as you get put into access. So I've actually had a case where I actually had students that were like one, two, three, one, two, four, one, two, five, all in the same group because their applications were all processed the same day at the back to back in the same course. Um, so good primary key is normally a numeric, but you can use other stuff. Uh, there's other stuff that you shouldn't use ever. Um, things that actually identify you in the real world probably should never be used as an identifier. Um, except for very specific use cases. Uh, for example, your SIN number in Canada, your social insurance number, should probably never be used in anything but uh, by the revenue agency. Then the government, uh, you should never use that. Uh, people's driver's license numbers, probably should never use that either. There's a few reasons. Uh, your SIN number can change. If your SIN number gets compromised because of identity theft, you can get a new SIN number issued to you suddenly all your old records are no longer valid. You shouldn't use phone numbers because phone numbers change. How many of people in here have had the exact same phone number their entire life? Now, this is where I can identify the ones that are 18 years old and those are those that are past a certain vintage. So how many in here have had the exact same phone number your entire life? All right, so probably 25 and under is my guess, right? I've had 12 phone numbers in my life. It used to be when you moved across a city, your phone number would change. Like I used to live on Carling by Westgate. When I moved to where I live now, which is a 20 minute walk from here, my phone number had to change because that's just how the phone systems used to be. And imagine moving from North Bay to here, your number wasn't going to stay there. Move from my hometown to North Bay, it was not going to be the same. So you try to keep things that are going to be unchanging. Um, a primary key can never be null. If it's null, it's not a primary key because it doesn't have a value. It must be unique. It must exist. So often we use an auto-generated ID because that way we know for a fact it's always going to be unique. It has no real world meaning. It just has meaning to the database application. Foreign keys. There's a primary key from another table used to connect the relationship. Um, it does not have to follow the rules of a primary key. It doesn't have to be unique. It can be null. Um, that's what determines whether the relationship is optional or not. Uh, the foreign key can be part of the primary key, as I discussed two slides ago. Um, and theoretically, a foreign key can be multiple columns. Essentially, it allows you to uniquely identify rows from another table, usually the parent relationship. A composite key 
is usually a primary key that's made up of more than one column. There are instances where, uh, especially old school database designers of a certain vintage, uh, the ones that smell like Old Spice and wear a little gray sweaters while they sit in their cave, they tend to not want to use auto-generated keys. They like using real world information because that's just how they were taught. And so sometimes you need to have multiple pieces to make something unique. So you'll have two columns in a single item, in a single table or more to participate in the primary key. And that's what, you know, is a composite key. Uh, like it, once, like the second bullet point is it makes sense to use existing columns in a table rather than assigning an auto-generated ID because it saves some resources. Yes. Um, in the sense back in the day when hard drives are measured in megabytes, not in, you know, gigabytes and terabytes. When I went through school, I had one of the most powerful computers of all my classmates. I had a 200 megabyte hard drive. And eight megabytes of RAM. Not gigabytes, eight megabytes. You know, one whole factor of size difference. Space was a premium back then. You did not want to waste space for anything. And computers and companies actually often, like I'm talking like the big computers, often had even less storage space. Like hard drives were measured in the... 20 megabyte range. So it made sense back then to reuse data as much as possible. Modern computers, I mean, my phone has, you know, 2,000 more, 2,000 times more storage than my first computer did. And my first hard drive was definitely not that size. It was bigger than this box. So, you know, that's what that point's about is sometimes it makes sense to reuse stuff that's later. But realistically with today's hardware, it's not that important. All right, so here's an example of a composite key. The only time you really see a good composite key is for an associative entity. I'll be talking about those later in the term. But usually an associative entity is a table whose purpose is to connect two other tables. So student classes, you guys have more, most of you in here probably participate in more than one class per semester. So each class has multiple students. Each student has multiple classes. That's the associative entity. That will have two foreign keys that are also part of the primary key. And that's exactly what this is showing. So the student ID and the course IDs are part of the primary key. Together they form a composite key. Realistically, if I were to design this a little bit better, I'd also add a semester. So that, you know, you decide to not succeed in this class and you have to take it again next semester, you'd be enrolled in this class again, but a different semester. Uh, this is an example of a customer to order where the customer is a primary key in itself and the order has a, a compound key. One of the two elements is a foreign key. So remember about five slides ago, I talked about how a primary key can participate a foreign key can participate in the primary key, but not be the whole primary key. That's exactly what this is right here. So the order ID is part of the primary key, and then the customer ID participates in this. Um, these are examples. Personally, if I were to design this table, the customer ID would not be part of the primary key. Why? Because each order can only ever have one customer ID anyways. Who cares? The order ID is what actually needs to be unique to be able to find an order. Can you imagine if you go to uh, Home Depot to return something, you go, okay, here's my order number. They go, can I have your customer ID too? Because I can't find that order unless I know your customer number. That's not how it works. So that slide is designed as an example. It's not a good example, but it's an example of what it would look like. Okay, so that takes care of the review on keys. And then there's probably some new stuff in there where I put in some asides. Okay. So first things first, we're going to talk about the basic parts of a table. So all tables normally have the following items. 
a name. So every object in the database, be it a table, a function, a, a index, you know, a view, whatever it happens to be, everything must have a name. Otherwise, the database server doesn't know what it is. So it has a name. This table we're going to use is called person. The columns each have a name. So in this case, we have sin and person's name. So a row is identified by a set of column values. So a row is a collection of columns. It has a primary key, and the primary key is used to uniquely identify a single row of data. You'll notice that we're using the good old sin number here as our example. But so this table is called person. It's got two fields called sin and name. If we were to look at it with data in it, it looks basically like an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I'm sh but you guys have already run queries. Therefore, you know what the data looks like coming out of after you do a select start from insert table name here. But that's basically what we're looking at. So <clears throat> those are the basic parts of a table. But before we have tables, we have something called entities. So now we're going away from the physical aspects of it. So we just got that out of the way. Just make sure everybody understands what that is. Now we're going to start talking about the concepts before you get to the table. Entities. So there are, when we talk about entities, there are three sets of phrases we need to think about. There's the actual entity itself. So an entity is a thing. It's a nice technical term, isn't it? It's a thing. But that, it just is, a, that's literally what it is. It's a person, it's a place, an object, an event, some sort of concept in the environment around you that's being collected. At the school, the most populous entity is probably student, right? And we collect information about our students. What kind of information do we collect about our students? We have your name, we have your contact information, we probably have your address where you're living, a phone number, an e a personal email address, um, date of birth. If you're a Canadian citizen, probably your SIN number uh, because the government wants it. If you're a international student, we probably have your student visa number or your passport number or some other government issued piece of ID to uniquely, you know, identify you outside of access. That is the information we collect about an entity called student. The entity type is a collection of entities that share a common set of properties. So if my entity is a student, the entity type is students. In other words, it's a collection of students. The entity type, the closest you can think of it, uh, you guys have learned about, have you guys learned about object-oriented programming yet? No? Okay. We're not going to use that example. Y yes. Yep. Okay, well, one person's done a bit of object-oriented programming. Um, this is an example that's easier to teach to the uh, CP students as they take a OO in the first semester. Um, but yeah, so the type is a collection. The entity is the definition. And then there's the entity instance. Each of you are an instance. So if our type is students, the entity describes what a student is. Each of your personal identification type things, like your name and your date of birth and whatnot, is an instance. An instance is a collection of every property of an entity for individual records. So those are the three big pieces of an entity. We're going to be learning about creating entities this week and next week. So an example would be a shortened word we use to refer to the entity type. So a person, the instance would be John Doe. That's literally the example. I just did it with using students because, well, your students, it's a concept you should understand. Attributes. Okay, so an attribute is a characteristic or a property of an entity. In other words, it describes the entity. So if we go back to thinking about our student entity, we have a name, 
we have a date of birth, we have a phone number, an address, an email address. Those are all attributes that describe a student. It does, it's not, this doesn't describe you as a whole. It describes what we care about to know about you. So those are the attributes we want to collect about every student. Every student must have the same pieces of information. Yeah, you might not have two phone numbers. You might not have a fax number. That's not even a thing anymore. But, you know, there once was a time where they asked you for your fax number. You might have, you know, multiple email addresses. Somebody else might not have multiple email addresses. The school only wants to worry about some of it. Often, these would be things we think of as nouns. You know, what is your name? What is your date of birth? What is your address? And then all attributes will have values. Whether the value is a null, a blank, a number, whatever, it's still a value. Well, null is the absence of value, but it's still a value. So, so an attribute, as like I just said, it's a property characteristic of an entity. Um, like in this case, this example is a person can be described by a SIN number and their name. Those are the properties also known as the attributes that describe a person as far as this example is concerned. For you guys here, like I said, it would be your name, your phone number, date of birth. Um, then we have relationships. How many slides in are we at? Almost a halfway point. All right, we're still doing good. Um, a relationship describes how entities associate with one another. Um, they're usually verbs. There's three kinds of relationships in a database. There's one-to-one, -one, one to many, and many to many. Um, so here's a quick example of uh, how entities associate with each other. That's what the relationship does. Uh, this course, we're gonna use, be using a notation called crow's foot. There's about eight different database notations for marking up relationships. We're gonna be using the one called crow's foot. It, dates back to the 70s. Um, some pocket protector type at IBM came up with it. And it's by far the easiest one to read and the easiest one to learn. Therefore, that's one we're gonna use. Um, this example here is saying that a professor has one office, so it's a one-to-one -one relationship. I'll be explaining in a moment what the different notations do. Um, so this is a summary slide. I'm not gonna go through the summary slide, but this basically covers what we just finished talking about. Um, because what's gonna happen is we are going to, um, later on I'm gonna go through the different relationship types and how you draw them and stuff. Okay, so an entity. An entity should be an object that has many instances in the database. You should never create an entity for one thing. Because what's the point of putting in a database if you're going to store information about one thing, and only one thing. I can't even come up with an example of a one thing entry. Um, so we want a database with an entity that tracks students, tracks professors, tracks courses, sections, that kind of thing. An object normally is made up of multiple attributes. There are some cases where there's only one attribute. Like for example, if you have a table that con contains categories. Theoretically, the category would just have a name, you know. Category is, I don't know, bundles, for example. So, but usually they have multiple attributes. Um, it should be something we're trying to model. So why would you have an entity for something that you're not trying to model? What's the point? Um, what it should not be, however, is it should not be a user of the database system. Now, that's not saying, you know how with Brightspace, you have a username and a password, you log in. That is an instance of an entity that tracks the users. An entity should not be a user. Like I should not have to create a new table for every student. There should be a table for students but there should not be a table called Dan or a table called Bob or a table called Jane. That means you're what you're doing is you're modeling an instance of something, not the thing itself. 
And it should also not be the output of the database system. In other words, you're not going to model and create a table for every report, for every output of the system. Like, can you imagine you pull up your banking app and you ask it for today's transactions and it goes and it creates a new table every time you ask for today's transactions? No, it's not going to do that. It just gives you the results. So there are two kinds of entities. There's the strong entity and the weak entity. A strong entity has a primary key. It is independent of other entities. It can exist by itself, onto itself, without needing anything else to exist. Again, back to my example of students. You guys in Access are strong entities. Each student record can exist by itself without needing something else to define the student. Obviously, there's other things that help fill out the concept of a student, but the student can exist without anything else. A weak entity, a slice says it does not have a primary key. It might have a primary key, but the primary key is also a foreign key. So if it doesn't have the foreign key, it can't exist. It's dependent on another entity. It's like, you know, that person that we all know that can't exist without their significant other. We all know someone like that, or we've all known someone like that. Weak entities are like that. If the thing that gives it purpose does not exist, the weak entity cannot exist. Now, we're going to use the example of loans and payments. For those of you that have got OSAP loans, you know about loans. You'll know about payments soon enough <laughs> in a few years. So a loan is a strong entity. A loan can exist on its own. It's uniquely identified, usually a loan number of some sort. A payment is a weak entity. A payment cannot exist unless there is a loan. Can you imagine you walk into the bank and go say, I want to make a payment on a loan. They go, well, what's your loan number? I don't have a loan. Take my money. The bank's going to look at you and go, what's wrong with you? Then they'll take your money. Because that's just what banks do. But, I'm kidding. God, if they ever take your money like that, just you're at the wrong bank. But, in this case, a payment cannot exist without a loan. Because there's nothing to make a payment against. So, therefore, a payment is a weak entity. The loan is a strong entity. It's like your cell phone bill. You have a cell phone bill. You owe money. That bill is a strong entity. If you don't have a cell phone or a cell phone plan, you can't pay the cell phone bill because there's no cell phone bill to pay. Right? Therefore, the payment cannot exist without that cell phone bill. It's the same idea. All right. So, attributes. Attributes are properties, characteristics of an entity or a relationship type. So, Relationship type, entity type, entity, it's all the same thing. Um, there are specific classification, though, when we talk about attributes. We have required versus optional. So a required attribute is an attribute upon which the entity instance cannot exist without it. A good example of that, again, going back to students, is you cannot exist without a name in Access. And for our fine students from India, you'll discover that they put your first name in twice or they put in your first name and a period for your last name, depending on how they decide to enter your records. Because, you know, some places around the world, people don't have family names. They just have a first name. I really don't know how that works, but they don't have a last name. So a name is a required attribute as far as a student is concerned. An optional attribute for a student um, student could be so, uh, phone number two. So you have a phone number. Maybe you have a second phone number. You have a home phone number and a cell phone number. Maybe you only have a cell phone number, no home phone number. That's becoming more and more common now. But the there could be a single phone number as required, but a secondary phone number might be optional. A student can exist without a second phone number. A simple versus composite attribute. A simple attribute 
your first name, your given name. That's a simple attribute. Fine, depending on where you're from, that's not necessarily a simple value, but it's a simple attribute. A composite attribute is an attribute that is made up of multiple pieces. A good example of that is an address. You know, we're all trained that when somebody says, give me your address, we all know what they really mean. It's 123 Sum Street, Ottawa, Ontario, K1K, 1K1. Maybe we add Canada on there. Our, it's a composite attribute. It's an attribute that's made up of other pieces. So you'll have, you know, the street address, the city, the province, the postal code, maybe a country. Could be a street address too. If you're in the UK, it could be city one, city two, because the UK is special that way. Um, some other parts of the world don't even have postal codes. It just depends. Uh, single valued versus multi valued. Um, and I bet, you know what? I bet I'm covering like four slides right now as I'm talking. Uh, single valued, again, back to your first, your given name. You have one given name. You might have a multi part name. Like you'll see some people with two first names, but that's cool. Bobby Jean kind of thing. Uh, versus multi-valued. Multi-valued is when it's a list of values. So when we're doing the design phase, we're going to talk about an attribute, for example, called skills. You have a certain number of skills. It's a list of values. That's what a multi-valued is. So I'm assuming most people in this room have at least one skill. Well, it'd be similar to an enum, yes. Uh, realistically, we don't store enums in the database. We create tables for those. But a multi-valued attribute would be a list of skills. So, for example, if you ask me for my list of skills and I just start going off the top of my head, you'd have PHP, SQL, Postgres, Linux, you know, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, that kind of crap. That'd be my set of skills. When I'm defining my skill set, that's a multi-valued attribute because it's a list. Stored versus derived attributes. Stored attributes are things we actually put in the database. Derived attributes are things we can calculate. And the best example of this one is one that everybody in this room has. What should you store? A person's age or their date of birth? Date of birth. Because you can always calculate their age. Now minus date of birth equals how old they are. Yes, date math really doesn't work quite like that, but that's basically how you figure out a person's age. If you store the derived attribute, that means that every single day you got to go find all the ones that need to be updated, update a bunch of records every single day. Whereas if you just store the date of birth, it just pulls it out of the system. It's a bit like, you know how you go to Wikipedia and you look somebody up on Wikipedia and it shows how old they were? Wikipedia is calculating that age. Not, there's, there isn't a job every night going updating everybody's ages. It just calculates the date, the age before it displays it to you. Um, another common derived attribute would be an order total. You go to Loblaws, you punch in four zero one one, and slap them on the on the on the scale. Then it it tells you you're paying a buck seventy five for what? Your bananas. In case you didn't know, four zero one one is bananas at every grocery store. Um, and we, all we need to know is how much does the bananas weigh and how much we pay for that unit of measurement. And that will give us our line total for the bananas because it's calculated. Now, most grocery stores will store the calculated values for speed purposes because, you know, Loblaws does a lot of, a lot of transactions in a day. But for smaller systems, you wouldn't store line totals. You wouldn't store order totals. You wouldn't store any of that because every time you pull it up, you, it can calculate it right away. Computers are fast enough to do it. Uh, and then we have identifiers, which again is our primary keys. Okay. Um, I already talked about required versus optional. So this is just an example of showing some required versus optionals. You can see that the student ID, the name, address, City, state, and zip code are required, but their major is optional. Sometimes people sign up for university and they haven't decided what they want to do yet. So they just sign up for a BA with no major. Um, that's the difference between a required and optional. Uh, simple and composite. 
I, like I said earlier, I was going through like four slides while I was just going through the bullet points. A simple attribute would be a person's name. A composite attribute would be an address. When you get to the point where you are creating the actual physical table, your composite attribute will be broken up into multiple pieces because that's how you do it. Now imagine if you didn't break apart your component pieces and we have a row that has an address in it. And we just so happen that we want to find everybody who lives in Cobden. So for those of you that don't know, which is probably a fair amount of you, drive up 417 until it turns into the 17th hour. You'll get to a little town by a lake called Cobden. But did you know, 50 minute walk from here, there's a street called Cobden. Therefore, if I'm searching in the database for an address that has Cobden in it, I'd get everybody who lives in Cobden, everybody who lives on Cobden Road, because the pieces aren't differentiated. So that's why we want to take these composite attributes and break them down when it's time to do the physical database. Um, simple and composite. Again, first name, middle name, last name makes up a name um, versus, you know, simple ones which is code in the title. And the multi-valued and the derived, I've just finished covering that too. Um, so the multi-valued can take on more than one value for the instance, skills. And a derived would be years employed. You know, like for the company I'm with right now, June 1st, it'll be 23 years. Had to think about that for a second. You know, they're not going to store how many years I've been working. They just care about when I started working there. Okay, so when we define attributes, I'm just going to hang on, stop that. Oh, man, we're doing great. We're going to be actually be able to finish this today. Oh, no. Don't do that. Where, were, where was I? No, not that one. This one. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's good. I knew where I was. It just I hit the wrong button when I went back in. PowerPoint used to be when you moved your mouse over the slide, it would actually show you what slide number you were on. It doesn't do that anymore. That's fine. Okay. So when we're defining attributes, we want to state what the attribute is and probably why it's important. So this is part of the design process. So when you're trying to decide what attributes are important. So again, let's pretend we're defining a student. We would say, what are the attributes we care about for a student? And then potentially we want to document why it's important. Not in the diagram, but in a, a document so you can float it amongst all the interested parties. You make it clear what it is, and you want to make sure you want to make it clear what is is not included in uh, the attributes value. For example, if you make an attribute called first name. You know what it's going to hold? A person's first name. You're not going to put in a person's birth in there. That's not an allowed value. Uh, if you're creating documentation, and if it may have multiple ways of being referred to, you probably want to document that. For example, what I call a first name, other people will call a given name. Some, Or if you talk about a, some people call it a fa last name, would be their last name, their family name, or their surname, depending on where you're from. They use different phrases for the same thing. So if that field or that attribute could have multiple names in the wild, you want to document that as best as you can. Uh, you want to state the source of the values. In other words, I want to know the student's first name. Who's the best source of that value? Well, you guys, right? Uh, that, but, but really what they're saying is it would be user input. It would be supplied by the you know, potential student. That's what they mean. Um, can the attribute change once it's set? As, a, as in other words, is it immutable or not? Honestly, other than your student number, everything is mutable in Access. People change names. 
people's SIN numbers change, people's phone numbers change. So you have to document whether or not that value can change after it's been put in. Um, realistically, usually most things are mutable. Uh, you specify whether it's required or if it's optional. Uh, again, probably the person's given name is required. Cell phone number two is optional. Well, it depends. So there is something called CAS. So have you have anybody in here ever heard of CAD? Computer aided design. CAS is computer aided software engineering. It was a big thing when I went through school. They still these things still exist. And essentially it's a special tool where you actually document all this stuff and it can output documentation. Normally um, this will be part of a design specification. So you're sitting down and especially if you get to start from scratch with the data, as in other words, you're interviewing people and saying, okay, we know this is the project, this is the information we need to know. Probably it's going to get documented in something, whether it's in a wiki in, um, I don't know, if you're in a Jira shop, probably in Confluence, uh, it could be in a Word document, could be, Depends where you work and what they use. If you're a company that you work for that uses CAS, it's going to be in the CAS system. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> you know. I wish they would, but no. No, it depends on who you... It's mandatory if your employer says it is. Trust me, my databases are not very well documented. You know how many people use the databases I create? No, let me rephrase that. Do you know how many people get to play with the physical aspects of the databases I create? Two people. Me and one other guy. We have a set of rules we follow for everything. But sometimes we need to provide documentation to our customers, and then we will provide lists of things that, you know, for a customer, you must collect this information. So we put it in plain English instead of a technical document. It depends where you work. For example, if you work for a company that provides um, for software, for for example, the Department of National Defense, there is a company in Ottawa that writes software for the DND. They use CAS software. The CAS software outputs the documentation in a very specific format that gets included with every piece of the design phase. It depends on where you work. That's the only answer there is. Should you? Yes. <laughs> And I mean, I just admitted I was a bad database designer because I don't document. Uh, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Um, but yes, it should be documented. And it, each company will do it differently. It depends. It, it really depends what you do more than anything else. Um, so after whether something's required or optional, you also, if applicable, uh, you're going to specify whether or not it's a min-max. In other words, can we only have one student? Can we have many students? Can each student have only one address or multiple addresses? You know, there's a few different things. Uh, you might want to indicate relationships with other attributes. So, for example, a course can have multiple sections. A course has professors. A course section has students. You'd document what the known relationships are for each attribute, if applicable. It's not always applicable, but you try. So part of this defining attributes part is you're trying to put down on paper, air quotes the word paper, as much as you know about every piece. Like you guys have already done a bit of programming at level one, right? You've noticed how picky computers are. It, it really cares about the details. And the goal of when you're defining the attributes is to put down as much documentation about what you know so that later on when you need to program it or create a database or write the application that talks to the database, you have something to refer back to to make sure that you're not missing anything. That's the point of that step. Um, you're going to put out your identifiers. Uh, by now, we've already talked about keys. When you're doing part of the design process, we actually have something called candidate identifiers or candidate keys. So when you are doing the initial design process, you may not have your primary key defined yet. You might have one, two, or three, or more, or less 
pieces of data that could be used to uniquely identify something. At that point, those are known as candidate keys. So you're going to create a new database for Revenue Canada. They're going to say, this is the data we want to collect. One of your candidate keys could be a SIN number or a tax identification number of some sort. That's a candidate key until you formalize the database structure. So an identifier, we already talked about that already. It's a primary key. Um, here we got a code, we got a course, and we got a title. Um, is this considered a good design? Not necessarily, um, because realistically, the course code could change. It has changed in the past. Uh, not for this program, but I know a computer programmer had a course called CST8282. Uh, they replaced it with CST8215. Course code changed. It's a good thing. Not necessarily, but at least it's a usable one in this case. Now, when we're talking about doing uh, some design decisions, what happens if you have multiple sections? You guys are actually kind of lucky because in your program, you don't really have multiple sections for any given course, right? You've pretty much been with the same people from the start. Um, hey? Next semester, you're going to have one section. That's pretty much how it goes. Semester after that, you'll have like half a section, but it'll be count counted as one section. Now, I'm going to go back and use a perfect example of CST8215, 8215. That's the level one database course for the computer programmer and computer engineering technology students. So two programs have the same level one database course. In September, we had seven sections of that one course. The way that little design was before, it would be terrible because there's no way we could actually keep track of the course, the students and what courses. So a better design would be the course code plus the section, which give us the course. But by the same decision, we could turn around and say, no, we don't want to do that. We want to do course number instead. Because in theory, if we suddenly need to add something else, we don't need to keep modifying the primary key. This example has code, section, title, course number, defines a course. However, when you think about it, what else? defines a course here at the school. So you guys know about the course number, CST8250. You know about the section, section 300 for you guys, right? The title is Database Design and Administration. What else identifies the course? No, that's a program. The term, 23S. So suddenly they need to say, oh, like way back, here Algonquin, before I started teaching here, any given course only ran once a year. So 8215 happened in September. 8250 only ever happened in January. Actually, I remember when 8250 only ran in January. I used to teach it back then too. So courses would only run in one given semester. And then suddenly they said, oh, well, we're going to start taking up a January intake, and now we have a spring intake. So some courses run three times a year, so they had to add yet another thing to help identify it. So now the course is identified by the course code, the term, and the section. So CST8250, 23S, section 300, is you guys. That is how we identify a course now. So none of these designs are good. <laughs> You know, the, the second one is better because they gave it a course number right here. So that at least we have a unique way to identify each course. And if we had needed to add another attribute to help identify it, we can. So criteria for identifiers. Uh, we want to choose identifiers that will not change in value. Identifiers that will not be null. In other words, it goes in once, it's there forever. Realistically, considering how mutable everything is in the world nowadays, SIN numbers aren't set, people's names aren't set, addresses aren't set, phone numbers aren't set, email addresses 
are not set. Actually, if I should have said saying how many people in here had their phone number, same phone number in their entire life, how many people in here have had the same email address their entire life? Same same guy. Eh? God, you're young. <laughs> so, I mean, in my life, I've had, uh, not counting my corporate email addresses, I've had four personal email addresses. I have three email addresses pre-Google. Before Gmail was a thing, every time you changed service providers, you had a new email address. So I had an email address in North Bay. I had an email address in Ottawa. I had a second email address in Ottawa. I had a third email address in Ottawa. And then suddenly Gmail was a thing and I stopped changing my email address. But you want identifiers that will not change, that will not be null. You avoid intelligent identifiers. These are when programmers try, I'm going to be smart. So I'm going to use an intelligent identifier. So we're going to use uh, an address as an identifier. We're going to use, heck, even SIN numbers are terrible identifiers because they can change. Anything that has really long keys, you want to substitute for nice short keys. Okay, so I'm at relationships, which is, how many slides left? Yeah, um, I'm guessing right now there's a bit of brain melt happening in the room. Normally, this is where I stop on the first day. Uh, you guys, you know, got easy in gently. Um, so I am going to call it here, and I'm going to pick up from relationships next week. Uh, like I said, the first two lectures are really long, so they I'll be able to cover relationships in most of lecture two next week, and then we'll be right on pace. So outside of that. Wait for the announcements as applicable.